Hi everyone, my name is Joshua Perez Cruet, MCAT tutor for Shamasian Academic Consulting, and today I'm going to be going through a sample MCAT biochemistry practice passage with you so I can share some of my key strategies for tackling these sorts of questions in this type of passage. Okay, everyone, so here's the beginning of our passage. And before I start going through it with you, I wanted to emphasize that you're really trying to read through the entire passage and answer all the questions in around eight or eight and a half minutes in order to be best suited for finishing that entire section and having a little bit more time at the end to go back to those specific questions that you found especially difficult or you might have flagged, okay? And here's my biggest tip for you when approaching any science passage. And I, I think this is, has been uh, a very helpful strategy for me. And uh, so I, I hope it can, it can also help you improve the way you approach these, these sorts of passages. When I'm reading any science passage, my goal is just to understand the passage well enough so that when I look at any of the different questions that are asked about the passage, I will know exactly where to return to the passage to have my question answered or to, to answer the question, to find the evidence to answer that question. I'm not trying to understand every specific part of a graph or every specific part of a complex pathway that is described in the passage during my first read because it might not even uh, be asked about. And I'm, I'm sure you've experienced that before. Uh, if, you, if you are uh, partway through your journey to uh, taking the MCAT, and if you're just beginning, watch out for that. Like you're, you're going to see uh, different pathways or different information in the passages that just isn't going to be um, asked about uh, in in the five to seven questions about the passage. Okay, so again, reading the passage just so you know where to find evidence when you're answering uh, all the questions, I think is is one of the most effective ways for taking a science passage. Okay, so let's let me let me show you what I'm uh, what I'm talking about here. Okay, uh, and, and let's let's start by uh, reading the passage. The endoplasmic reticulum is a multifunctional organelle and plays a crucial role in protein folding in lipid biosynthesis. Proteins synthesized in the ER are post-translationally modified via N and O glycosylation. The SEC fifty nine gene encodes adolicol kinase that is required for N glycosylation in the ER. Researchers interested in studying the role of SEC 59 created and characterized a SEC 59 deficient cell. Okay, so there's uh, quite, a, quite a bit of information in this paragraph and I think the most important information uh, just from my perspective of reading this and in, in all the other science passages that I've read both as a tutor and as a uh, prior MCAT student myself, is uh, this ending sentence of the paragraph. This is where they're explaining the point of their experiment. And I think when, uh, especially when a passage is about one or more experience, uh, experiments, it's really important to know why they're doing the experiment, okay? So they're studying the role of this gene and they created a cell line that doesn't have that gene. And that's super important. The second really important part of this paragraph that you know, I see time and time again is the passage talking about a gene and then the protein product that it encodes. So keeping track of a gene um, linked to its protein is a little bit more complicated than just focusing on uh, one or the other which is why the, <clears throat> why the MCAT likes to test if, if you're able to uh, keep track of that. Another uh, very common motif, if you will, that I see in these passages for uh, chem phys and also bio biochem are these 
membrane receptor protein pathways. So uh, you will have an extracellular messenger that binds to a membrane receptor or some membrane uh, protein. And then that membrane protein has an effect inside the cell um, by like activating a primary messenger and a secondary messenger. And, you know, keeping track of all of those together is really difficult. And so usually those are the things that are talked about uh, or, or, and also uh, asked about in uh, your questions for the passage. But remember, like I said, you're not, I don't think it's a really effective strategy to try to understand everything that's going on during your first read of the passage. Because if it's not asked, you're really just wasting your time. Okay, paragraph two. In experiment one, researchers created a deletion in SEC591 and analyzed levels of phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylinositol, and phosphatidylserine. Equal amounts of wild type in SEC591 delta cells were grown in YPD medium at 30 degrees Celsius. Equal amounts of cells were harvested in a time-dependent manner. Lipids were extracted. Phospholipids were separated by two-dimensional TLC. The amount of phosphorus was quantified. The results are shown in figure three. Okay, so this is a lot of this nitty gritty detail again that I'm talking about, okay? I don't think it's important at all to uh, look at these methods right now. Really the most important thing is that you know if a question comes up that asks about TLC, you, you're gonna have to go back to this, uh, this paragraph. But trying to think in your head like, oh, what is TLC? Maybe I did it in uh, chemistry lab a couple years ago. Um, how does it relate to the goal of this experiment uh, or, or the researcher's study? It's not important at this point and will only be important if you're asked about it. The thing that I see as really important in this uh, paragraph, but again, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, is, is just seeing, uh, the wild type insect 591 delta cells. Okay, so in the last paragraph, it talked about uh, researchers were interested in studying the role of SEC 59 in characterized the SEC 591 deficient cell line. That was their goal. Uh, so this is the SEC 59 deficient cell line. So if you weren't aware, now you should know that this delta uh, refers to SEC591 being deleted. So that gene is deleted in the cell line. So yeah, uh, that's, that's the first two paragraphs. And, and here we go. Here's our first figure. Um, and figures are one of, the, one of the parts of the science passages that really throw off a lot of students because what you, when you looked at figures in the past, you, you generally, whether it's in the scientific literature or with a class um, or for another exam, you normally have to spend a lot of time scrutinizing the figure and, and having a comprehensive understanding of it in order to be successful with whatever types of examinations you've had in the past. And that's just certainly not true for the MCAT. Again, this strategy of knowing where to, where to look back throughout the passage or uh, into different figures when, uh, when you're reading the questions and are asked specific information or, or asked for specific evidence is a lot more effective than trying to understand every part of the passage. So what's, what, what do I look for uh, in the figures during my first read? Well, I'm definitely gonna read the title. And I'm going to read the title before I look at the, the figure, because usually the title will tell me everything that I need to know about the figure for my first read. Okay, so the title is Relative Amounts of Various Phospholipids in Wild Type versus SEC591 uh, Delta Cells. So this, this graph, without even looking at the graph, is telling me how different phospholipids compare in uh, cells with SEC 59, uh, 59 one in cells without. So really like, I don't even have to look at the graph too much because I already know what it's gonna tell me. And if there's a question that asks about how the levels of phospholipids compare in wild, uh, wild type versus SEC 59 one delta cells, I know I can, then I'll go back to this figure and check it out. 
Um, sometimes it's, it's good to look at the, the uh, Y and X axes and uh, the legends, but again, it's a lot of information. It's taking time away from your ability to look at other information that the questions for the passage are specifically asking about. So, you know, my advice is really just to blow through the figures once you know what they're talking about. Um, and then something else that I want to point out uh, right away that's really important for uh, answering questions about figures effectively is significance. I think significance is, is one of the most important things you should pay attention to in a graph, especially when you're, um, when you're trying to answer questions. And the reason is that when you're, when you're trying to prove uh, that an answer choice is right, you always want to favor something that has that is supported with significance than anything that is just a a um, a trend or a correlation that's not supported with significance. So when I see these stars, um, that that is an indicator of some measure of significance, uh, along with p values in in error bars as well. So really pay attention to those things when you're trying to answer questions. It might not be super helpful while you're reading the passage. And, um, and, and use that to, and, and make sure you know the different uh, uncertainties uh, or ways of representing uncertainty, okay? All right, so let's go to the third paragraph. The researchers then hypothesized that an overexpression of SEC59 might also have an effect on lipid composition within the ER. To overexpress SEC59, researchers cloned the gene into a, a YEP352 vector. In experiment two, uh, the researchers also investigated phosphatidic acid, lysophosphatidylcholine, and cardiolipin. Researchers investigated wild type cells with an overexpression of SEC59 through addition of the YEP352 vector, SEC59 one delta cells, and SEC59 delta cells rescued by YEP352 vector exogenous SEC59 one. The results of this study are shown in figure four. Okay, so here's again another example of a paragraph that has a lot of information, you know, a lot of big words. Um, and, you know, when I'm reading this paragraph, I don't pay attention to these big words that much or these, uh, like all these different cell lines. And I, so, so I can see that they're looking at four different cell lines, but, but I can come back to this information after I read questions if there are specific ones about it. I don't have to think about what, what it actually means to have a cell line rescued by a vector exogenous SEC uh, 59 one. I can do that uh, if I need to. What I think is important about this paragraph is, is this part right here. So in previous paragraphs, the researchers were deleting SEC 59 and here they're overexpressing it. So if there's any questions about overexpressing, uh, this gene, I know that I'm going to probably have to come back to this part. In figure four, it looks even more complicated than the, uh, the, the first figure. So I'm just going to read the title. Relative amounts of various phospholipids with overexpression and deletion of SEC59-1. Okay, so, so again, this is really telling me that all that I need to know about this figure for now. Um, they're measuring different phospholipids when uh, SEC59-1 is being overexpressed and uh, when it's being deleted, and they're, they're comparing them. And then um, the last sentence uh, here. In experiment three, researchers determined that dolichol kinase-dependent protein glycosylation directly or indirectly plays a role in suppressing beta oxidation. Okay, so uh, the, the one important part of this sentence, I think, is beta oxidation because that's one of our um, high yield or maybe not super high yield, but one of the areas of content that the MCAT specifically tests your understanding of. So if I, uh, if I see any sort of indication that there's a question about beta oxidation, I'm going to come right back to uh, this sentence, okay?
So yeah, that's my first read of the passage. And, and again, remember, I am not spending any time trying to understand anything in the, any of these paragraphs that's really specific. I'm just kind of blowing through it and making sure I am well suited for returning to the paragraphs to find the evidence I need to support any question answer that I think is, is correct. Okay, so let's, let's do it. Uh, let's look at these questions. Which of the following is the most reasonable conclusion based on figure three? So here you go. Uh, it's literally just asking me about figure three. So now I need to go back and uh, understand figure three. But it, like, again, it didn't really make sense for me to look at and try to understand figure three until they directly asked about it. Um, in the way that I like to answer most science passage questions is through process of elimination, if I have time, because I really want to eliminate all the wrong answers and choose the right answer. And that, that's a question of for you, whether you have enough time to do it or, or not. But usually the way I approach a passage is by reading each of the answer choices and trying to prove or disprove them. And that might take, uh, that, that's going to take a lot more time than thinking of what you uh, believe the right answer is in, in hopefully finding it. And the reason I have enough time for that is because I had my specific passage strategy of just going through the passage as quick, as quickly as I could. Okay, so uh, which is the most reasonable conclusion? Wild type cells lack adequate levels of ER phospholipids. I don't even have to look at the figure for that one because a wild type cell is a cell that is normal. So it is going to have adequate levels of phospholipids. Cells lacking SEC591 contain higher levels of phospholipids compared to wild type. Okay, so we're looking at uh, these, these two cell lines, okay? The wild type and uh, cells lacking SEC591. And uh, it looks like SEC591 um, mutants have much higher levels of phospholipids and that it's supported by significance. So remember, I, I found that uh, support for significance. And if you're confused by that, basically these stars mean that the difference between these two bars is significant. Okay. And and it looks like I, in, in the more stars you have, the more significant it is or the more asterisks you have. Uh, so, so this answer choice is supported by significance and is shown in the graph. So I think that's a great answer. But let's quickly look at C and D. SAC59 acts as a transcription factor to repress phospholipid expression. I have no idea why or how it works. Um, so, so, there's, there's nothing in the figure that talks about uh, how um, phospholipid expression is repressed. And then uh, question choice D. SEC591 is the primary repressor of phospholipid overproduction. You couldn't possibly determine that because we're only looking at SEC591. So there could be tons of other re repressors of phospholipid overproduction. So um, I think B is correct. So let's go to uh, answer question, question two now. According to the results from figure four, what effect does SAC 59 overexpression have on phospholipid levels? So again, now I'm going to go back to figure four and I'm going to look at SAC 59 overexpression. And um, ideally I'm gonna compare it to a, a wild type um, cell line because I'll be able to exactly compare overexpression versus regular expression. So let's go back to the figure. Um, in, in, in the legend, it says, so I do have a wild type. So that's what I'm going to be comparing to. And um, I need to remind myself also um, how things are being overexpressed or how SEC59 is being overexpressed. It says that um, researchers have investigated wild type cells with an overexpression through addition of this vector. So um, here we go. The vector is, is uh, or the overexpression cell line is right here. So I'm gonna compare these two and see if there's significance. 
And so, so this is what I'm looking for here. As you can see for these two um, columns, uh, there is no significant difference, uh, unlike for this one. So I'm going to go ahead and think that it's, um, that the levels remain constant, but let's look, uh, let's look again um, and, and check out the answer choices. So increase in phospholipids with overexpression. Uh, we already determined that it's not an increase and we already determined that it's not a decrease. Um, and, and like I thought, um, phospholipid levels uh, remain constant. So I think that's a great answer. And then um, for D, phospholipids are shunted into gluconeogenesis. I have, uh, gluconeogenesis was not discussed at all in the passage. So um, that's kind of some additional, inf I, I would need a lot more additional information to support that. So it, you, you saw through my, my strategies for answering question one and two, two different strategies. So one is to look at the answer choices and then go to the passage and try to disprove or prove all of them. And then in question two, I went directly to the figure um, knowing exactly what I was looking for, overexpression versus wild type. And then I came up with a prediction and then um, supported or found an answer that supported my prediction and uh, eliminated all the other answers that didn't uh, go in line with uh, my prediction or what I observed from the graph. So those are two different ways of attacking these types of questions that you can use. All right, question three. In a new experiment, researchers use 32P. What is the resulting element if the phosphate undergoes alpha decay? So this is one of those classic questions where it's technically a passage question, but it has nothing to do with the passage. So you actually just have to use your own um, previous uh, conceptual knowledge to answer this question. And this is just a radioactivity decay question. So I'm going to go to my periodic table to remind myself what the atomic number of uh, phosphate is. And um, if I do that, I can quickly find that um, phosphorus has 15 protons. Okay, so remember, this is my mass number. This is my atomic number. And uh, alpha decay is a um, process in which um, a helium nucleus is uh, released from uh, your atom that is undergoing that decay. So um, all I have to do to determine what the resulting element is, is subtract the mass number of helium from the mass number of phosphorus and the atomic number of helium from the atomic number of phosphorus. And so um, again, reminding you that the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons and the atomic number is the number of, uh, just the number of protons. And so if I go back to my periodic table, I see that the element with 13 protons is aluminum. Okay, and that answer choice is right here. So that was, a, that was a pretty simple one. And a good way to check yourself with these decay questions is to make sure you have the same number of protons and neutrons or a mass number and atomic number on either side. So I'm gonna add four and eight, uh, four and 28 together, that equals 32, two and 13 together to equal 15. So I've done my sanity check. All right, let's go on to question number four. Researchers observe an increase in acetyl-CoA in SEC 59-1 delta cells. Based on information from the passage, which of the following explanations best describes this observation? Well, I know acetyl-CoA is related to beta oxidation, so I might need to be uh, going back to that, that last sentence of the passage for this one, but let's, let's look at the answer choices just to start. Okay, SEC 59 deficient cells produce higher levels of phospholipids, which are converted into acetyl-CoA through beta oxidation. Um, fancy that. Uh, so here it is. 
Um, so we already determined that SUC59 deficient cells produce higher level phospholipids, right? That was uh, figure, figure three here. So the, the deficient cells, significant, a significantly larger amount of phospholipids. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, and these phospholipids are converted into acetyl-CoA through beta oxidation. So I also know uh, from my conceptual understanding of beta oxidation that lipids are converted into acetyl-CoA units during this metabolic process. So this seems like a perfect explanation. So I'm gonna circle that, but I'm also gonna make sure B, C, and D don't seem uh, correct as well. SEC591 deficient cells must decrease flux through glycolysis in order to conserve energy. Um, I don't think there was any mention of glycolysis in this path or in, in this passage. So I can immediately get rid of, get rid of that. And, and remember um, something that might've confused you or you might've thought was related is this glycosylation. But glycosylation is completely different than glycolysis. So glycosylation is uh, adding a sugar to a protein and modifying the protein. Um, in, in glycolysis is that metabolic process where you can get a small amount of energy by metabolizing or breaking down glucose into pyruvate. So glycolysis not really related here. And then let's look at answer choice C. Acetyl-CoA accumulates as the Krebs cycle stops. Well, the Krebs cycle, which is also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, um, or the citric acid cycle as well. Um, th that's not, again, it's not mentioned in the passage. And um, so, so I can immediately get rid of that. It doesn't, it doesn't explain um, this, this observation because we didn't really see this in the passage at all. Um, and then let's look at D. Cells with SEC591 can only use phospholipids for energy production, causing beta oxidation to occur more rapidly. Okay, so I'm not really sure about that. Um, so, so we see that this, this protein glycosylation pathway, which the, the dolichol kinase um, was encoded by this gene, um, and this gene suppresses beta oxidation. Um, so cells, cells with this gene should have a, a, a slower uh, rate of beta oxidation because um, this pathway is repressing or suppressing beta oxidation. So this is an opposite. So be careful for those opposites and you know, be careful to keep track of like which cell lines are increasing the amount of SEC59 and which have, uh, or overexpressing and, and which have uh, kind of, which are, which have deleted that gene, okay? Because you gotta keep track of all those and the different um, effects they have. So, so pay careful attention to that, but, but again, only paying attention to that when you need it to answer a question. And I think this is the last question, yeah, it is. Okay, so the YEP352 plasmid encodes a gene for ampicillin resistance. All right, so this is some additional information. Researchers treating a YEP352 transformed bacterial colony with ampicillin should expect. Okay, so ampicillin resistance basically is it's it's a resistance to a um, antibiotic okay and this is this is a plasmid that was talked about um, I believe in uh, this paragraph here where they're um, they're over expressing sec 59 through addition of this vector okay so when they add this this plasmid to the cell line they're trying to get over expression of sec 59 and in order to, um, the, in, in my, my guess, even before reading this question, is that um, they're adding the ampicillin resistance so that any cell that uptakes this plasmid, 
which contains this gene uh, will be resistant to antibiotics. So you can add an antibiotic to the, or you can add ampicillin to that cell colony to get rid of any of the cells that didn't uh, uptake or, or be transformed uh, by this plasmin. So transform basically means um, they incorporated this plasmid into their genome. So let's look at the, the question answer choices. Surviving cells, um, uh, researchers should expect surviving cells to have lower levels of PC when compared to PC levels in untransformed cells. Okay, so this is asking me to determine if the transformed cells have lower levels of PC than untransformed cells, which this would be, again, a wild type. Um, and I, I remember that figure four had something to do with the overexpression. So let's look at um, the transformed again versus the untransformed. And it specifically asks about PC. So again, we're looking at these two columns again, or these two bars of the graph, and there's not a significant difference. So this is, this is not correct. The surviving cells or the transformed cells don't have lower levels. Um, and then answer choice B, surviving cells should have similar levels of PE and PI compared to those of untransformed cells. So I'm looking at the same um, sort of comparison between wild type and transformed cells uh, again, but I'm looking at PE and PI. And again, both of them have uh, not, they're, they're not significantly different. So they do have similar levels. So this seems like a great answer choice. And then um, C, let's check to make sure these are incorrect, hopefully. Uh, YEP352 cells remain sensitive to ampicillin. Well, if, if these cells um, incorporated this plasmid into their genome, they would be resistant to ampicillin because there's an ampicillin resistant gene. So they're, they're all going to be uh, resistant to it. So that's incorrect. And then acquired resistance, um, researchers treating this colony with ampicillin should, uh, should expect acquired resistance to develop rapidly in cells with the plasmid. Well, when you have the, the plasmid, you already have resistance to the ampicillin antibiotic because you, you were, the, the, the bacterial colony was transformed with this gene. So there's no development of resistance. It's just simply already there. Okay, so I've answered all of the questions and now I'm going to see how I did. So B is correct uh, for one, uh, C is correct for two, um, C is also correct for three, and uh, four A is correct, and five B is correct. So, so we did really well in this passage. All right, that's it for this MCAT Biochem Practice Passage walkthrough. If you found this video helpful, make sure to hit the like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our new videos. And if you'd like to receive a free MCAT question of the day, click the link in the description box below. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.